Hi again. I want to talk to you today about biblical finances. The idea of biblical finances encompasses a number of different ideas that the Bible gives us and principles of the kingdom of God that the Bible gives us. And there are many falsehoods that are taught to churches that have become standard teachings throughout the body of Christ, which is a very sad thing. But if the Bible says something, that's what we should believe and that's what we should be acting upon. So I'm just going to outline what the Bible says, what biblical finances are for a New Testament believer, a New Testament Christian, and what are the principles that apply to us today. So the first thing I want to outline is that the New Testament points out a certain grace of giving. Here we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 7, how it says that, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Now, this giving does not apply to any one particular thing. It talks about giving in general. It's a grace of giving. So let's look at it totally in context of what these verses are saying. Now, brothers, we want you to know that about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Okay, so these people had extreme poverty and they had rich generosity. Now, neither of those things is told to us to be a good thing. It says that in their extreme poverty, it doesn't say that their extreme poverty was good or bad. It says that they had extreme poverty and that their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urged and pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this servants to the saints. I want you to notice something. These people were not urged to give. They were not told to give. They urgently pleaded with us. This is Paul talking. He says, these people who in their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, these people urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in the service to God's saints. Paul did not ask them for a gift. If, God, if Paul would have looked at them, he would have seen their extreme poverty and would have said, okay, well, we'll look somewhere else. But these people, they gave even beyond their ability, and it, they did it entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded for the privilege, the privilege of sharing in the service with the saints. But as just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, the apostles, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And this grace of giving that he's talking about is entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with the apostles for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So the first thing you got to notice about this is that these people gave out of their own desire to give. Verse 12 tells us, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. Now notice that Paul's desire here, Paul didn't ask these people that had poverty and were giving in rich generosity despite their poverty. He wasn't asking them to give. Paul's desire was not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. He wanted provision for everyone. Paul said in verse 14, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. So I want you to notice something here. Paul wanted everyone to be provided for. He wasn't calling for socialism here. He was calling for equality as far as having your needs met. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. In other words, sometimes you're going to have, and sometimes someone else is going to have. But the idea is that everyone be provided for. Verse 15, as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. 
So notice that everyone is gathering here. It says he who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone's gathering here. In other words, everyone's working and trying to gain and provide for themselves. They're gathering for themselves here. This is not socialism. This is talking about, okay, this is talking about he who gathered. That's all of us. We're all working to provide for our families, to provide for our loved ones, to provide for ourselves. But the most interesting factor about all this is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. In the same chapter, right in the middle of it, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and we know that Jesus was rich, and he didn't become poverty-stricken until he went to the cross, and he had all his clothes taken from him. His money bag was, now Judas Iscariot had the money bag, and, and he had betrayed Jesus. So Christ was left with nothing. He, had, he, he was rich until he went to the cross, and even his clothes were taken away. He died naked and destitute. So Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Jesus Christ was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. When did that happen? At the cross. At the cross. Everything was taken from him. He was completely poverty-stricken at the cross. We know that during his ministry, he was rich. We know that Judas Iscariot stole from the money bag, and he thought no one would even notice. You also notice that Jesus never used his money bag. There's never a a case in the Bible, in all the accounts of the New Testament, where there was a problem, and Jesus said, go to the money bag and get money out of the money bag. Nope, that never happened. He always provided, he, he multiplied what the people had as far as food, the fish and the loaves of bread. He multiplied it. When Peter needed the temple tax, Jesus told him to go catch a fish and he'll have a four drachma coin that'll pay his tax and Jesus' tax. Jesus never used that money bag. He never he had people giving to his ministry, but he never even used it. He was rich because the cattle on the thousand hills belonged to his father. Because the silver and the gold are God's, according to Haggai chapter 2. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, how was he rich? He was, remember, he had provision in everything. He didn't even have to use his money bag. Jesus was rich in that all his needs were provided all the time, constantly, and he never even had to use the money. It wasn't about money. It was about constant provision, having everything he needed. The Lord Jesus was completely rich. The guards, when he died on the cross, the guards cast lot for his undergarment because it was so valuable. Jesus was a rich man, and Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. So in this sense, God wants you to be rich because otherwise he wouldn't have Jesus be poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. For your sakes, he became poor. What Jesus did at the cross was substitutionary. He took our sins at the cross. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. He, what he did was substitutionary. For your sake, he became poor also, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And what kind of riches is this talking about? Through his poverty, you might become rich. The only way Jesus was ever in poverty was financially. At the cross, he didn't have anything. He, He was rich throughout his entire ministry. At the cross, everything was taken from him. Judas Iscariot had the money bag and he had just betrayed Jesus. There was, Jesus had nothing when he went to the cross. That was the only time that he ever had poverty. So we know that what Paul's talking about here is so that you through his poverty might become rich, provided for in every way, like Jesus was. Jesus was rich and he was provided for in every way. It's not that he needed money. It's not about money. It's about that he was provided for constantly in every way by God. And that is the riches that we have. If we move on to the next chapter, we see in chapter 9 of of 2 Corinthians, Paul continues on this subject. Verse 6, he says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So this is a spiritual principle that Jesus told us. He said, Give and it shall be given to you. Cast your bread upon the waters and it will come back to you. Give and it shall be given to you is a principle that Jesus taught during his ministry. And Paul is reiterating this. He's saying, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, men will pour into your bosom. And it's according to the amount you give. You sow sparingly, you'll also reap sparingly. 
and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Jesus told the parable of the talents, where the man who had five talents, he invested his five talents and got five more, and he ended up with ten talents. The man with one talent buried his in the ground and gave it back to Jesus, and he didn't get anything out of that. He came out of that with zero talents. The guy with five talents came out of it with ten talents. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But the very next verse is the key to all this. This cannot be forced. This principle cannot be forced on anyone. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I wish churches would read this part right here. This is Paul saying, it, telling us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, do not give reluctantly or under compulsion. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. You've got preachers out there preaching saying, you know, God will bless you so abundantly if you give more than what you've decided to give. No, 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 no. It says each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. The result of that is if you if you don't sow as much, you will not reap as much. And if you sow generously, you will also reap generously. But this verse 7 trumps that. It says each man should give what the money should actually give. In other words, this principle is true here. But the amount you should give is what you have decided in your heart to give. We have preachers up preaching and trying to tell people to give more than what they've decided to give. That is evil. That is anti-biblical. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Some There are some cases where a minister actually might want people to give more because they understand that, yes, he who, who uh, sows sparingly will reap sparingly. But the problem is this principle won't work if the person is not get, if the person is giving under compulsion because each man is supposed to give what he has decided in his heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion so for a pastor to try to change a, a person's mind or a preacher or a teacher or anyone to try to change the mind about how much a person's going to give is evil it's under compulsion it's giving under compulsion that is not right god loves a cheerful giver uh, see, it's not about what you get back. See, the problem is everyone looks at, oh, well, whoever sows uh, sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Well, the problem with that is you're looking at what you're reaping. What did Jesus say? Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yet we have all kinds of ministers out there saying, well, you who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, so you got to give a lot. Well, it's not about the reaping. It's about the sowing. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. It's not about how much you give. It's not about whether you give sparingly or whether you give generously. It's about a cheerful giver. And why is that true? Why is it about a cheerful giver? Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This is what giving is about. Giving is about having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. When you, when you have provision, you're able to abound in good works. What we have today is a lot of preachers who are just basically getting themselves rich and building bigger church buildings and, and then not even providing for the people in their congregations because really the money that is given to a church is supposed to go to the people in the congregation, not to the pastor and building a building. In, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that you're supposed to build a church building. That is not in the Bible anywhere. Now, if someone tells someone to build a church building, okay, go ahead and do it. But that is not something the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to provide for everyone in the church. If we go back to chapter 8, 
Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their supply will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. And as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much. What we have in the church is people who gather much and they have too much. They don't share it. They're not giving to their congregations. See, if church is bringing lots of money, they should be spreading that out to the people in the congregation. They're the ones who are giving the money to that congregation. That should be spread out so that there would be equality. Everyone's provided for, in other words. Not, not socialism. This is not talking about socialism. This is talking about everyone having their needs supplied. There's people that are giving out of their poverty, and other people are becoming rich and not sharing. That is just completely against what God is talking about here. He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. God's provision is for everyone, because verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, is that riches dependent upon your giving? It isn't, is it? Because it says, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, we know he was rich during his ministry, yet for your sake he became poor, that's at the cross, that's at the cross, that's, that's something he did for us, at the cross, so that you through his poverty at the cross, that's the only time he had poverty was at the cross, might become rich. This is a provision that God made not based on your giving. The principle of giving and receiving exists entirely outside of God's provision for you. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously is a spiritual principle. If you look at a farmer, if a farmer plants a whole ton of crops, he's going to get a whole ton of harvest. If he doesn't plant very many crops, he's going to get a smaller harvest. That's because if he sows sparingly, he will also reap sparingly. And if he sows generously, he will reap generously. That is a basic principle of God. That is a principle of this world. The whole world operates on the basis of abundance. God made the world to provide for us abundantly. And it's mankind that has broken that cycle with GMO crops. GMO crops, you know, do not provide seeds to be replanted. You have to keep buying seeds every year if you're a farmer using GMO seeds. That's an anti-biblical idea. The idea of provision is how God made the world. God made the world with abundance of provision for everyone. So people take this principle, which is, it is a spiritual principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That is a, if you look at any farm, you'll see that this is a spiritual principle. It is a principle of this world that God set in place. But that has nothing to do with God's provision for us. At the cross, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Well, so what is this provision that God has given us? What is this provision that is not based on giving and receiving? If we look at Galatians chapter 3, and we look at verse 13, it tells us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Remember, the curse of the law was put in place by Satan when Adam handed the world over to Satan. Satan became the god of this world because God made Adam the god of this world. And then Adam handed the world over to Satan. And Satan created the curse of the law. And that's why God gave the people the law in the Old Testament, the Israelites. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting at verse 1, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land. Well, hold on a second. I thought it says that he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly and he who sows generously will reap generously. Yeah, that's a spiritual principle that God set into motion on the earth. But this is the blessing of the law it's talking about. If you fully obey the Lord your God, the fruit of your womb will be blessed. 
the crops of your land and the young of your livestock. That's where you get your financial provision. That's where your, your riches came from back then was in your the crops of your land and your livestock, the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flocks. This is all that would make a man rich right here in the Old Testament. All this was part of the blessing of the law if you fully obey the Lord and follow all his commands that God gave you today. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. That's another provision. That's, that's like give us this day our daily bread right there. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. In other words, you'll be blessed in everything you do. Verse 8, the Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. Now, that's how you gain your provision in this world. This is how a man becomes rich, is that there's a blessing on his barns and everything he puts his hand to has a blessing on it. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he's giving you. Now, he's talking to the Israelites here because he gave the law to the Israelites so that they could avoid the curse of the law that Satan put upon the earth. And the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. And now I want you to notice something. This is all part of the blessing of the law, the blessing of the law. If you fully obey, if you fully obey the Lord your God and follow his commands, then this is the blessing of the law that follows. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground in the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. All this has to do with riches, becoming rich. This is how Abraham became rich right here. Is the fruit of his womb, the, his livestock, the crops of the ground, all these this is how a man becomes rich right here. Abundant prosperity. Verse 12, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, and send rain on your land in season. What does rain in the land do? It causes the crops to thrive. And bless all the works of your hands. Whatever the works of your hands are that, that are your working on to give your family provision, to provide for your family, to provide for yourself. It says that he will bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will borrow from none. You'll not be in debt. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God, I give you today and, and carefully follow them. You will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Now, here's the, here's the curse of the law, starting at verse 15. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm upon, I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, we just read in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is this right here? If you do not obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, these curses will come upon you. This is the curse of the law, starting at verse 15. Do you want to know what the curse of the law is? Here it is, right here. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. This is the opposite of the blessing of the law. It says you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Well, if you're under the curse of the law, you will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. Wouldn't you know the blessing says that your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. The curse of the law says your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed, the crops of your land, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Once again, this is the exact opposite of the blessing of the law. The blessing of the law is... Your livestock is blessed. All your Everything is blessed. Everything that is blessed is cursed under the curse of the law. This is what Satan brought upon the earth, is this curse of the law. And God was trying to protect the Israelites from this curse. He said, if you obey God's laws, none of these curses will come upon you. And we know the curse of the law could not have come from God because remember, any kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And since Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, he could not have caused the curse of the law. God could not have caused the curse of the law. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, which means it was from Satan. And we know that the curse of the law is the opposite of the blessing of the law. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Well, that, it said you'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out as part of the blessing. So you see, the exact opposite of prosperity 
is the curse of the law. The curse of the law is poverty. The curse of the law is the exact opposite of the blessing of the law, which is abundant prosperity. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. So the blessing of the law came in the Old Testament if you fully obeyed the Lord and followed all his commands that I give you today. Now, how does that apply to a New Testament believer? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, where did condemnation come from? From transgressing the law. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus, in other words, is the opposite of the law of sin and death, which is the curse of the law. The law of sin and death is what Satan wanted to come upon everyone in the world. And, and God, by giving the Israelites the law, was trying to deliver them from the law of sin and death. And Christ made you free from the law of sin and death. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We read in Galatians 3.13. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, no one could live up to the law. No one ever did. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned sin that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's those who are born again. We, we not walk not after the flesh. We walk after the spirit of God. The spirit of God lives in us. We're born again, new creations in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. The NIV actually says this better. It says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Well, hold on a second. Deuteronomy 28, the, cur the blessing of the law. If you fully obey the Lord your God and obey all his commands, then all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you. If you obey the Lord, you will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. All this good stuff comes upon you. And finally, he just comes out and says, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. In the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your land, and the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. Now for us, that land is salvation. The land we have because of the blessing given to Abraham. Remember that God told Abraham that through you all nations will be blessed. Remember Hebrews 11.6, For without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, Abraham was before Israel. Israel didn't exist until Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was Israel. So this, is, this predates the law. This predates Israel. Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, if we go back to Galatians 3, 13... We see that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So you see here that in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, it tells us the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us. And by those righteous requirements being fully met in us, we have the blessing of law. If you fully obey the Lord, you got to carefully follow all his commands. The righteous requirements of the law, those are fully met in us. Those commands are fully met in us. 
So all these blessings are upon us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. It just blatantly told us that in Galatians 3.13, he redeemed us from this curse. And the curse is the exact opposite of the blessing. It's the exact opposite. We have the blessing because the blessing comes to those who carefully obey the Lord's commands and the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us through Jesus Christ's work at the cross. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 can tell us that you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty, the only time he was ever in poverty was at the cross. That's the only time. So that through you through his poverty, that means at the cross, might become rich. What did he do at the cross? Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed it is everyone who is hung on a tree. At the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's exactly what 2 Corinthians 8, 9 was telling us, that we're redeemed from the curse of the law. Yet for your sakes, Jesus became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. So you see that the principle is true in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But that's not telling them to give more or give less. See, the provision exists for everyone. Christ did it at the cross. You receive it or you don't. The provision exists for everyone. This is a spiritual principle. All the crops use this principle. When you sow a lot of crops, you get a lot of harvest. If you sow very few seeds, you get very little harvest. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves, God loves a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver. That's what God is looking for. See, because God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able to do this. He doesn't say he'll do that if you don't sow sparingly, if you, if you sow generously. No, no, no. See, this is a principle that exists regardless. This is something you see throughout the earth. This is a principle that is true. And yes, when you give more, you'll see that rich people who have a lot to give, they will give more. And yes, they will get more back because there's more money being sown. But provision for us does not come by our sowing and our reaping. That's not where provision comes from. Provision comes from God. God is able to make all things abound to you. And how did he do it? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower. Now notice that the sower doesn't have any seed unless it gets supplied to him. So you see that God supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food. The same one who supplies seed to the sower, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But he who supplies the seed to the sower also provides bread for food and will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now, there's no condition on this. You notice there is no condition. He has scattered his gifts to the poor. There's no condition on verse 10. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower, he supplies, you can't give in the first place unless he provides you seed to sow. He's also the one who provides bread for food and supplies and increase the store of seed so you can sow more because the more you give to good uh, things, then the good works will abound out of them. Good works is what God wants to abound doesn't want everyone to just store up riches for themselves. And he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. That's what God's interested in. You will be made rich in every way. Does that include finances? Yes, it does. Doesn't it? every way. It doesn't say some ways. It says every way. You will be made rich in every way. And this is not contingent on your giving, not on your sowing or your reaping. This is God able to make all grace abound to you. And how do, we just read in 2 Corinthians 8, 9 that he did it at the cross. 
you will be made rich in every way so you can be generous so that you can be generous on every occasion. In other words, you can't be generous in the first place if you don't have the seed to sow. He who supplies the seed to the sower, that's God. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I like the King James Version better. It says, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. So what causes thanksgiving to God for us is we're being enriched to all bountifulness in everything. We're being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, not just financially, but in every part of our life. We're being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. And that causes through us thanksgiving to God. When you're blessed in your life, what's the first thing you do? You thank God, thanksgiving to God. You thank God for the blessing that he poured out on you. So it's inevitable after all this that people are going to ask one question, and this always comes up with every person that I've ever heard of. People say, well, what about tithes? What about tithing? Well, let's look at tithing in the Bible. Genesis chapter 14 is where tithing originated. This is before the law ever came into place before Israel was even in existence. Verse 14, when Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Notice that Abraham had in his own household, he had 318 trained men. He was already prosperous. He was already rich here. And it says, during the night, Abraham divided his men and it, to attack them, and he routed them and pursued them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. And he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. After Abraham returned from defeating Keterlomer and the allies and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then, in response to that, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. In the Old Testament law, the tithe was entirely different than what Adam, Abraham did here. Abraham, in response to Melchizedek, bringing out bread and wine and blessing him and saying, blessed be Abraham God, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. In response, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Abraham went on after this to become even richer and never gave, is there any account of him ever giving a tenth of anything? So this, this tithe here is a one-time deal that Abraham did in response to Melchizedek blessing Abraham. So we know this is not talking about the Old Testament tithe. It's not talking about the New Testament tithe. It's not talking about any kind of tithe that applies to Christians. So what about Genesis 28? What about Jacob? After Jacob saw the dream where he saw the stairway that went up into heaven, Early in the next morning, Jacob took a stone and placed it under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if the Lord will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my Lord. So here Jacob is giving a contingency. He said, I'll worship you, Lord, if you provide for me, if you'll be with me and watch over me on my journey. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, Jacob, of course, later would be named Israel. So basically, this was the, the covenant of Jacob. And the covenant, therefore, of Israel, since Jacob became Israel. He said, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So this is Jacob speaking. Remember, Jacob is not a great nation. He's just himself at this point. All the other people in the world are outside of this statement. 
this is just Jacob. And he says, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So some people will say, well, this is the Jacob covenant and that God reiterated this through the law because then the tithe came into existence and that was for Israel. And so, yes, that a covenant is when two people, one person on each side, both does the same thing. And Jacob, yes, he said he would give a tenth. And so God said, okay, you give your tenth and I will be the Lord, your God. I will watch over you. And Jacob's promise in return is that he would give a tithe. He would give a tenth. So yes, this uh, giving of the tithe does predate the law, but it does not predate Israel. And it is has directly to do with the nation of Israel because Jacob is Israel. All the descendants of Jacob are Israel. And the tithe of the Old Testament came to existence because of this covenant that Jacob made with God. I will give you a tenth. So then in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we read, These are the decrees and laws you should be careful to follow in the land the Lord your God of your fathers has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. Verse 5, But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among your tribes to put his name, therefore his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes, your tithes and special gifts. That what you have vowed to give and your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. In chapter 14, it tells us in verse 22, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your field's produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, the firstborn of your herds and the flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose for the dwelling of his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So the tithe was to be brought to the temple and it was, and they were eat to, to eat that tithe in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. Then in verse 24, if that, if that place is too distant and you've been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, other fermented drink, or anything you wish. And then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your town, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns." so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, so the Lord your God may bless you in the works of your hands. Now, this is all part of the commands of the Lord your God, and this is what was given to Israel to provide for the Levites. That was a tribe of Israel, and they were to bring all their tithes in. This is all part of the law. And you notice even then, they were supposed to eat their own tithe of their grain and their wine and oil, and they should use the silver of their own tithes, and they were supposed to partake of it themselves. They were supposed to buy cattle and wine and fermented drink or anything they wish, and they and their household were supposed to eat of their own tithe in the presence of the Lord. And they also were supposed to not neglect the Levites. In other words, that part of that tithe was supposed to go towards the Levites of the towns. So that was a, a Jewish thing. That was an Israel thing. That was part of the law. Now, if you read Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations. See, the, the Old Testament law is canceled and its regulations. It is canceled. It was against us and stood opposed to us because no one could live up to it. It was nailed to the cross with Christ. And that disarmed the principalities and powers because Satan accused the brethren by using the law. He would say, they broke the law. Therefore, I have the right to bring the curse of the law upon people. That's why Jesus canceled the written code with its regulations. That's why God nailed the law to the cross with Christ. And he canceled the written code with its regulations. The law. He canceled it. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear we know it has not disappeared because a lot of the prophecies of the old testament have not come to pass yet so the old testament in its entirety is not 
passed away. It is aging. It will soon disappear. But the regulations we know were canceled. Colossians 2.13 told us its regulations were canceled. The new covenant has made the first one obsolete. The law is obsolete. We know the regulations of the law were canceled. We know that whoever lives under the law is under a curse. Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. So you want to live under the law? Well, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, and God canceled the regulations of the law. And all who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And that would include the animal sacrifices. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is the whole reason the law was put into existence by God, was to protect us from the curse of the law. That's the whole reason the law was put in place. God gave the law so the curse of the law would not come upon us. Because when Adam committed high treason and handed the world over to Satan, Satan set the curse of the law in place. Because we know Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus knew the thoughts. He said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So in the same way, how could God's kingdom stand if he created the curse of the law and then redeemed us from the curse of the law? See, he, God's kingdom is not divided against itself. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom that will never be ruined. So you see, the tithe has no place in a New Testament believer's life. There's no place for the tithe. The tithe is something you do by choice. If you give a tithe, it's because you want to give a tithe. It's not something that's required of you. In Malachi, God told the Israelites who were under the Old Testament law, will a man rob God, yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. The Israelites were under the Jacob covenant to give a tenth of everything to God. They were under that covenant still until that covenant was canceled when Jesus came. This is Old Testament. This is Malachi speaking. He says, will a man rob God, yet you rob me. In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, that I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and provide such blessing you will not have room for it. And then he mentions the curse of the law. I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your field that they, so they will not cast fruit. All the nations will call you blessed and yours will be delightful land. Well, hold on. That's the blessing of law. And this is the curse of the law. We're redeemed. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law already. This could not be applying to the Christian church. It could not be. Otherwise, Galatians 3.13 is false because Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And with the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us. So we have the blessing of the law already. And here he says, I will prevent the, press, the pest from devouring your crops if you don't rob God by not giving your tithes and offerings. They were under the old covenant. They had to give the tithes and offerings. They were under that covenant that Jacob made with God. So if you're going to believe Malachi is for the New Testament believer, you're completely deluded because that is not the truth. The, the Old Testament law has been canceled. We're not under the law. And in the New Covenant, there's no place in the New Testament that tells us that we should have to give a tithe to anyone. I've heard uh, uh, many Christians try to say that Hebrews chapter 7 is talking about Christians uh, giving the tithe. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, remember that's who Abraham gave a tenth of everything to, the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and also that of king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, having no descent, 
having neither a beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth as a priest continually. This is all talking about Melchizedek. For consider how great the man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Notice that Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. This was not given according to the law of Moses. This was something Abraham gave to Melchizedek as a one-time gift. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. We know that's not all the tithes. We know the people themselves ate part of the tithe. We just saw that. According to the law, that is, their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. So in other words, he's saying the Old Testament law, they were supposed to give tithes to the Levites. You know, some of their tithes went to the Levites. But he whose descendant is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. So in, in other words, this tithe had nothing to do with the Old Testament law tithe, the tithe that was given by the Jews under the Mosaic law. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And he received a tithe that had nothing to do with any of the tithes afterwards. Verse 7, And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. So Melchizedek is the greater one. And here, men that die receive tithes. Now that was still happening. Remember, this was written in Hebrews chapter 7. The temple was still up. They were still giving tithes. The Levites were still receiving tithes. The tithes were still going to the temple. So he said, Here, men that die receive tithes tithes. But there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Now this is talking about Melchizedek once again. And he was just talking about how Melchizedek received this tithe. And then verse 8, he says, here are men that die receive tithes. And they still were. The Jews were giving Old Testament Mosaic uh, tithes to the temple, to the Levites. But there he that receiveth them, there being Melchizedek, he received them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Melchizedek, in other words, still lives. He received tithes from Abraham, despite the fact that he was not part of the Mosaic law. And here, the Levites were men who died. Melchizedek is the one it's talking about here. All this is talking about Melchizedek. Verse 1, Melchizedek. All this, he of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. That is Melchizedek. He received tithes. Verse 9, and as I may so say, Levi also who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. So Paul, as a, as a parallel here, says, as I may so say, he doesn't say that it's necessarily true, but he says, as I may so say, Levi, he so to speak, he kind of paid the tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek, even though he didn't. Levi didn't pay any tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham did. For he was yet in the loins of his father when he, Melchizedek met him. Starting at verse 11, I'm going to start with the NIV because it's easier to understand. It says, If perfection could have been attained through Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come? That's Jesus Christ, one in the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron. For when there is a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that there our Lord descended from Judah. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priests. In other words, the Old Testament law did not apply to Jesus Christ, to Jesus Christ's priesthood. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an undestructible life. For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. The former regulation, that's the law of Moses. For the law made nothing perfect. See, the former regulation is talking about the law of Moses. For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. 
And Jesus lives forever and has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who came to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So notice verse 27. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. Jesus, the high priest of our con confession, the priest of the new covenant, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Chapter 8, verse 1. The point of which we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary a true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. He would not be a priest because he's of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is of the tribe of Judah. For there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the, prescribed by the law. In other words, right now, at the time of this writing, the temple was still intact, and there were Levites who were offering the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. They serve. See, that temple was still intact and the Levites were still serving at a sanctuary that is a shadow of the one that is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry of Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant, which he is a mediator, is superior to the old one and is founded on better promises. And later on, we see that by calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. The old covenant law is obsolete. And the tithe was part of the Old Testament law. And that law is obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. The law in its entirety is not disappeared because the prophecies of the law, like in Daniel and in Joel, those have not all come to pass yet. And not one jot or tittle of the law will disappear until all the prophecies have been fulfilled. But the regulations were canceled already. We see two places where it tells us that this covenant, the first one is obsolete. The covenant itself is obsolete. But Colossians 2.14 tells us that having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away. God took away the law, nailing it to the cross. We know the law has been canceled. So the tithe does not apply to a New Testament believer. A New Testament believer is under the New Covenant. The principles of the New Covenant are shown us in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. He did it for us. He, so that through his poverty, his poverty at the cross, we might become rich. And the desire is that no one be hard-pressed, but there be equality, that everyone be provided for, that at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, and in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. He who gathered too much did not have too much. He who gathered too little did not have too little. See, God wants everyone provided for, and he wants everyone to be under the blessing of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we could have the blessing. You will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. So see, this is God's provision. God, we will be made rich in every way so that we can be generous on every occasion. It's God who's able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able to make all things abound to you. How did he do that? 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Jesus Christ at the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13. And we received the blessing of the law because Romans 8 tells us that the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us. Why? Because he condemned sin. God condemned sin in sinful man by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. He condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. So there's nothing here about your provision being because of your giving. It's because of God's work at the cross. He condemns sin and sinful man and the requ righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us. So the blessing of the law in Deuteronomy 28 belongs to us. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb. All this is if you obey 
fully obey the Lord your God and carefully obey all his commands. The righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us. So this is already met. This condition is already met. And all these blessings are upon us. We are blessed in the city, blessed in the country. We need to lay hold of these blessings in order to, to get actually have them in our lives. We need to speak these forth, speak them forth in faith, and make them become a reality in our lives. Because remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's the new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world, the world to himself in Christ. God reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. In other words, people have the, the ability to receive this reconciliation. God reconciled the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. And he committed us the message of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In other words, people have a choice to be reconciled to God or not, to receive salvation or not. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. In other words, if you don't confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and don't believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll not be saved. So it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth you confess and are saved. So this is the principle by which verse 9 works. Verse 9 works because verse 10 is true. It's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess unto, unto salvation. Jesus said this too in Mark 11. Mark 11, 23. He said, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. And then verse 24, in prayer. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So faith is how we receive the blessings of God. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So the blessings of God belong to us, and we're supposed to believe they're true. This is what the ancients were commended for. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists, even though you can't see him. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You're supposed to believe God rewards those who earnestly seek him. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken with that same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak. Verse 18. For we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The spiritual realm all around us is eternal. And we should be living our lives according to the spiritual laws of the spiritual kingdom of God that is all around us. So the blessings of God have already been given to us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3, 13. And the provision has already been provided for us, but we're supposed to receive it by faith. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. We know the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's provision. That's the provision that Jesus lived in through his whole ministry. So thanks for watching.